Hello Year 11s. Uh, in this video, I'm going to just briefly run through all your PAGs, your required practicals. You have eight of them for your GCSEs and two of them have uh, two experiments in them, which makes a totally 10 experiments for you to go through. On each slide, I have given you the experimental setup and the method that we use. Uh, wherever relevant, I have added points for accuracy and uh, safety. And then again, I have added uh, YouTube links to other videos where you can see these experiments uh, being done or being explained further. So all the experiments, all the videos might not be exactly the same, but then you will be getting a rough idea uh, in addition to my explanation. So let's start with the first pack, which is determining densities. By now, all of you are very clear on what the equation to find density is. Density is equal to mass over volume. So normally the unit for density would be kilogram per meter cube. You do sometimes see it as gram per centimeter cube also. So to find the density of an object, this equation tells us that we need to have two things. Yes, the mass and the volume. Finding the mass is very easy. Do you remember how you found the mass when you did this PAG in year nine? That was once upon a time, isn't it? So you just had to keep the object on the mass scale and you will note down the mass. Then finding the volume is the interesting bit here. To find the volume, you first need to identify the shape of the object. So the object that is given to you can be a regular shaped object like a cuboid, a cube, a cylinder, a sphere, it can be any of those. Or it can be a irregularly shaped object, which means it doesn't belong to any of these regular shapes. Based on that, we have different ways to find the volume. So let's concentrate on a regular shaped object. What, show, what is shown here is a cuboid. So you use a ruler and you measure the height, width and length of the cuboid and then plug it into the equation for the volume of a cuboid. You would do exactly the same thing if it is a cube, if it is a, so if it is a regular shaped object, all you need to do is think about the formula and then you just substitute the values in it after finding them using a, a relevant apparatus. Most of the time for regular shaped objects, you will be given a um, cuboid or a cube. Now, when it comes to irregular shaped objects, we don't have a formula that fits into the pattern. So we have two different methods to use. One is a more common one, which this will serve different types of irregular shaped objects. Even if the size is slightly big, this method would be a suitable one to use. So as you can see there in the figure, you have a Eureka can. So Eureka can has a spout or a nozzle and you fill uh, it with water up to the spout. Then what you do is, as you can see in the picture, the object whose volume you want to measure, you immerse it in that water. So the water level rises. How much water uh, level has changed, that will be collected through the nozzle in a measuring cylinder kept next to it. By looking at the measuring cylinder, you can measure the amount of water collected and that will be the same as the volume of the object. If you don't have a Eureka can and the size of the object is not that big, you can always go for measuring cylinders on its own. So as you can see in the diagram there, the first one tells you that there's no object in it. You have taken a measuring cylinder with water up to a particular level and then you have put the object in it. Then what happens to the water level? It rises. So how much has the water level, uh, by how much did the water level rise? That increase in water level should give you the volume of the object. So now by one of these methods, you find the volume, you have the mass already, convert them into the relevant units of kilograms and meter cubes, and then find the density by dividing mass over volume. If we talk about accuracy in this experiment, 
The main one comes when you're reading the measuring cylinder. You need to make sure that you read the measuring cylinder from your from your sorry at your eye level. Otherwise, you would, you're not reading the right. Uh, you you would not be getting the right readings. This is called parallax error. You don't have to worry too much about the words. So in case they ask you, what is what can you do to improve the accuracy of your experiment? Definitely, you will say you will repeat the experiments. And other than that, each time you're using the measuring cylinder to take readings, you will measure the readings at your eye level. And I have added a link to a video there which you can watch. And hopefully that will help you to enhance your knowledge in this. So now the second part we have is the Hooke's law, where we are going to add different forces and see what happens to the extension in the case of a spring. So the experimental setup is as shown. You can see there a spring fixed to a clamp. You have mass hangers from the hanging from the bottom of the spring and you will need a ruler on the side to measure the uh, length each time you add a mass. So we will set up it uh, as shown in the diagram, but we don't hang the mass hanger first. So we just leave the spring on its own and then using the ruler on the side, we will measure the original length of the spring and then we will make a note of that. Then what we do is we start adding the masses. We add one mass at a time and then we wait. Obviously, when you add the mass, it's spring, so it's going to oscillate. So you wait for the oscillations to stop. And then you again, using a ruler, you will measure what is the new length of the spring. You will do the same thing for each mass added. So say you added, say, something around five, six masses at least, then you will start to find the extension each time. So you know the original length of the spring, then you know the new length for each mass added. So you can easily calculate the extension by new length minus original length. So you have the extension. Now what will we do? You'll record the results. In, so in your previous table where you have made a note of the masses and the, the new lengths, you will record the extension also. Now, one thing you have to be careful is the masses you have been adding, they are masses, they are not force. How will you convert mass into force? We need to multiply that by the gravity. So we are adding the force that we are adding is the weight. So weight is equal to mass times gravity. So another column in your table, which will be for the converted masses to weights. So now, you have at least five to six readings of uh, the forces or the weights added on the spring and the extension each time. So with that, what can you do? You will plot a graph of uh, force against extension. And what will the graph look like? This is how the graph is going to look like. So the force against extension graph you can see it is a straight line that passes through 0, 0. So they have a directly proportional relation. So keep in mind, whenever you see a straight line graph passing through 0, 0, please make use of the keywords directly proportional. Don't just say that as force increases, extension increases linearly and all those things. OK. And then they can always ask you to calculate. They can give you a graph like this and they can ask you to calculate the spring constant. So spring constant tells you how easy or how difficult it is to extend that spring. It is a force for unit extension. So you need spring constant is force divided by extension, which if you look at the graph there, you can see it is the gradient of the graph. So uh, it doesn't have to be a, a, a PAG based question. They can just give you a data and then they can just ask you calculate the spring constant from the graph. So if you have a force extension graph, spring, spring constant is 
the gradient of the graph. Regarding accuracy, again, I would say reading the ruler correctly is the main thing here. So you can have a pointer from the bottom of the spring, a horizontal pointer which point to, points towards the ruler and you can take the reading at I level. And then this one has an aspect of safety measure also. So keep make sure you're standing uh, well away from the table of the setup so that in case the spring snaps and weights are falling down, you would be fine and uh, make sure you will wear goggles again in case the wire snaps. Like the previous one, I'm adding a link to the video which will again give you further explanation. Now moving on to PAG3. PAG3 has uh, two experiments in it. A part is how to calculate the acceleration of a trolley down a ramp and B part is Newton's second law. So let's see how we can calculate the acceleration of a trolley down the ramp. Now for calculating the acceleration of, the tro of a trolley down a ramp itself, there are two methods. So method one is where uh, you have a trolley on a ramp, as you can see, and then what here we use is timer and a meter rule is what we are going to use. So you would do the setup as you can see there. Make sure that the uh, angle of the ramp is not too high, otherwise it, it would come down really fast and it's going to be difficult for you to measure the time. So you set up everything there like that and then you just release the trolley. Please make sure you don't apply any force on the trolley. You just release the trolley and you start the timer exactly at the same time and you make a note of how much time did the trolley take to go through the whole ramp. Okay, that is what we do first. We just measure how much time it takes for the trolley to cover the whole ramp. Then what we do is uh, we release the trolley again from the top of the ramp, but this time we don't start the stopwatch as soon as you release the trolley. You wait for the trolley to reach the distance that we have marked. You can see that we have marked a 30 centimeter distance at the bottom of the ramp. So we wait till the trolley enters the marked distance. As soon as trolley enters that distance, we start the timer and we record the time it takes to travel the last 30 centimeters of the ramp. Now, for both finding the time taken to travel the whole ramp and the time taken to travel this 30 centimeters of ramp, both has to be repeated more at least two times. Huh? It's good to repeat it three times and then find an average. Now, why are we doing this? So we released the trolley from rest, isn't it? So we have, when we did the equations of motion, we have already discussed that. When an object is released from rest, its initial speed is going to be zero. U is going to be zero. So we released the trolley from rest. So its initial speed is going to be zero. What about the final speed? That for that, that is why we found out the time it took to travel that 30 centimeters. So there, if you do speed is equal to distance over time, you can find out what was the speed of the trolley to cover that last 30 centimeters. So you have the final speed there. Once you have the initial and final speed, you have already studied the equation for acceleration, which is acceleration is equal to change in speed divided by time. And then you can find the acceleration. Now this is another method for finding the same thing, the same acceleration of a trolley down the ramp is by using light gates. Uh, light gates, the best thing about light gates is you don't have to do any calculations. So you do the same experiment, you just click on a couple of buttons on the data logger and you get your value for acceleration. So this is exactly this. We are trying to do exactly the same thing. We have a ramp. We are uh, releasing a trolley from the top of the ramp and then we are finding its acceleration. Now, how do light gates actually work? I have added a link uh, in the slide which you can click and see how the light gates actually work. 
So uh, you don't have to know how it works. So that is the best thing about this. So in case if anybody finds the working of light gates a bit confusing, don't worry. You just need to know that light gates are uh, scientific equipments that help you find velocity, acceleration, etc. accurately. So here also you do the same thing like before. You set up the apparatus. You on the top of the uh, ramp and at the bottom of the ramp, you set up two light gates. You again release the trolley from the top of the ramp and you wait for it to come down. And all you need to do is just, as I said before, just click on the data logger. It will show you the acceleration. So what the light gate does is when it crosses the first light gate, it calculates the speed of the trolley there. When it crosses the second light gate, it calculates the speed of the trolley there. So you have the initial and final speed and it will also automatically calculate the time and then it will do all calculations and give you the acceleration. Now this is a link you can use and see how actually a light gate works. Now this link will only tell you just how a light gate works. It's not going to tell you anything about this particular experiment as such okay now the advantage of this method compared to the other if they ask you why is this method better or which method is better you will say this method is better because here uh, it is more accurate why in the previous one you have to start and stop the stopwatches in it so the human reaction time comes into it here there's nothing of that sort the second experiment in PAC-3 is proving Newton's second law. So what does Newton's second law state? F is equal to MA or acceleration is directly proportional to the force. So that means if I apply more force on an object, that object is going to have more acceleration. So how can we prove that? Again, we use the light gates here to make it easier. So you can see a trolley there. And then you can see the trolley is connected to some masses using a through a over a pulley. So here what we will do is so first you add a particular mass to it and then you re, you release your mass and then it will pull the trolley and you will be able to calculate the acceleration. We don't have to calculate it. The light gates will do. So you start with a force of 100 grams on it. 100 grams is 0.1 kilogram times 10, that is 1 Newton. And you record, you look into the data logger to see what the acceleration is. Then you will repeat. You will keep adding 1 Newton each time and we will again go for around say 6 different values. For all the values, make sure you repeat the experiment and calculate the mean. That is another way of improving the accuracy of the experiment. And then you will plot a graph of force against acceleration. What would you expect to see? A straight line graph passing through 0, 0, which proves that force and acceleration are directly proportional. Again, here, uh, for accuracy, you should say you will repeat the experiment and find the mean. Anything they ask you about safety, it is about the string can snap, the masses can fall on your hand, legs. So make sure that you keep a fair distance from the apparatus. Again, uh, there is a link for a video which clearly gives you a bit more visual explanation of what the, uh, how you can do this practical. 